We're live. The appointed hour of 6 p.m. having been reached, I welcome everyone to this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals. My name is Craig Meadows. At the request of Steve Judd, Chair of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals, who is unable to make tonight's meeting, I call this meeting to order as the acting chair. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, and extended again by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. Non-in-person attendance of meetings of the members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Additionally, the meeting recordings may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and the ZBA webpage. Please indicate if you wish to make a comment by clicking the raised hand button when the public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the Zoning Board of Appeals Chair. If speaker doesn't comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 40A and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Emerson Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties in interest. We'll begin with a roll call of the regular members of the ZBA. Uh, I'm Craig Meadows. I am here. Philip White. Present. Uh, associate members of the ZBA, Sarah Marshall. Here. And Dave Slovatar. Here. Um, also in attendance at the moment is Rob Wachilla, planner and ZBA staff liaison. Rob Mora will be joining us approximately seven o'clock tonight. Uh, any other members that you see on the call, Rob? Tommy? No. And I yeah. want to mention that uh, you stated earlier that uh, Steve Judge, who's the chair, wasn't able to make tonight's meeting. Yes. The Zoning Boards of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth of Men for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, and convenience and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important elements of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw is Section 10.38. Specific findings from this section must be made for all of our decisions. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen, or as I described the, the call by star, pushing star nine. The chair will assist the staff uh, call upon people who wish to speak when you are recognized, present your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by a public meeting for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the application tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits. The board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily, for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decision. 
No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20-day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with a relevant judicial body in superior court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the Registry of Deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, the roll call, followed by the minutes, approval of the minutes for November 9th, 2023, then a public hearing. Public hearing is ZBA FY 2024-07, Gabe Krause's, parentheses, Gabe's underground, request for a special permit under sections 3.352.3, 5041 and 5.042 of the zoning bylaw to create an establishment consisting of a restaurant and a nightclub with pre-recorded entertainment, two patio areas for outdoor dining and a total capacity of 300 occupants. At 23-25 North Pleasant Street, map 14A, partial 50, general business district, BG. Zoning district, and DRB and MPD overlay districts. Public meeting then will follow, then discussion, general public comment period, other business not anticipated within 48 hours, and then an adjournment. The first order of business tonight is the approval of the minutes from November 9th, 2023. Has everyone on the board had a chance to review the previous minutes? Are there any comments or edits that are needed for the minutes? Everybody shaking their heads no. I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes from November 9th, 2023 with edits if needed. Is there a second? Is there who a, moved? Is there a motion? <laughs> I'll move Excuse it. Excuse me. Give me a motion first. And I'll second. And a second. Perfect. <laughs> the vote requires a roll call. The chair votes aye. Mr. White. Aye. Mrs. Marshall. Aye. Mr. Slovatar. Uh oh. David, are you on mute? I think he's temporarily away from the screen. Oh, there he is. Oh, there he is. Yes, he is. He is back. He had to settle something. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. But this Steve Judge told me I don't have to announce a momentary departure because it's too disruptive. <laughs> so. I'm sorry, what is the question? The question is, there. this is a vote for the, uh, to approve the minutes of November 9th, 2023. Yes. I read them and I approve. Okay. Very so good. Final I. Unanimous approval. Cool. Okay. And thank you for your tolerance. <laughs> and you, <laughs> of course. Uh, next is ZBA. FY 2024-07, Gabe Krause's, Gabe, Gabe's Underground, 23-25 North Prospect Street. Prospect Street? Sorry, that's a typo on my part. It's uh, Pleasant Street. Yes. North Pleasant Street. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So it's 23-25 North Pleasant Street. Correct. I and lived the, there for uh, many years. The uh, petitioners are in attendance, uh, Mr. Chair. Do you want me to promote them, or is there anything else you want to announce beforehand? I think we just need to have uh, members sitting on the panel are myself, Mr. White, Ms. Marshall, Mr. Slovatar, Mr. Judge, who is absent tonight, will use Mullen's rule to rejoin the panel at a later date if the re this involves reviewing meeting materials and watching the video recording. Okay. All right, Are there so... any disclosures? Okay, the following uh, submissions have been received by the town staff. ZBA FY 2024-8 application, ZBA FY 2024-8 management plan, main floor plan, occupancy load and seating plan prepared by Ristrom Walker Metcalf III dated 10 16 23 
updated 12-4-2023 and 12-12-2023. Sign renderings, Gabe's underground menu, outdoor seating cut sheets, outdoor lighting photographs, outdoor lighting nighttime comparison, awning lights, nighttime comparison, design review board recommendations, uh, design review board FY 2024-07, article four decision, uh, Hazel's Blue Lagoon, comments from other town departments, Amherst Police Department received 12-13-23 and Amherst Fire Department received 12 -13. 1323. There was also a re site visit on Tuesday, December 12th at 4 p.m. I wasn't able to attend the site visit myself. Would one of the other panelists who did attend please give a brief update to the board? Who would like? David, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Philip White was there, Sarah Marshall, Steve Judge, and I were there. We got a tour of the interior of the building. We saw the two sides of the proposed restaurant and nightclub. We walked through both. We saw the connection. So we have a very good sense, I think, of the physical layout. We also went outside and got a, a, I believe, a very good understanding of how they, uh, of the physical characteristics of the building that they will need to address for outdoor dining seating and also access to both the club and the restaurant. So we were there for an appropriate amount of time and the applicants were I think very cooperative and forthcoming, and we got a good feel for what is in all the documentation. So it was a, a very positive site visit. Uh, there were some questions that came up during the Hold site. Hold on, Craig, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I, I yes, would please. just add, add a couple things to what we please. talked about. Um, some controlling uh, on the nights when both the nightclub and the restaurant are open, controlling controlling how patrons move back and forth and when the nightclub is closed, but the restaurant staff still need access to the kitchen, just, just how they're going to prevent people from going into the closed nightclub and also about managing, uh, well, just how they're gonna manage patrons moving back and forth or leaving the building. Thank you. Great. I see there were some questions that came up. Uh, have you got the applicant on board with us? So I can Rob? Pr promote them right now. Uh, okay. So applicants, if you are listening, uh, please accept this panelist invitation and you'll be able to be seen and heard. Hello. 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 How are you? Hello. Welcome. I'm going to unblur the background. There we go. Very good. Um, there were some questions which I can, uh, during the site visit, they were brought up. Uh, I don't know if you heard them, but let me state what they were. And then why don't you give us a presentation to tell us exactly what your intentions are, okay? Okay. Can you please state your names and addresses for the record, please? Go ahead. My name is Andrea Hunter, and my address is 142 South Longyard Road in Southwick, Mass. I'm Gabe Kraus. My address is 252 Elm Street in Westfield, Mass. Great. The questions that came up during the site visit were, Will access to the kitchen be primarily from the restaurant side of the business? The second question was, why have a separation between the rest restaurant and the nice club use? And thirdly, would you clarify the hours of operation for the restaurant and nightclub? Would you consider having two sets of hours in a, of operation posted? Okay. Oh. Yeah. Yes, Rob? 
just want to clarify, um, there were a bunch of questions that are asked, but these are the questions that weren't addressed by the materials that you submitted to us for review prior to this hearing. Just wanted to further clarify that. So I didn't mean to interrupt. You can go ahead and continue with your presentation. Okay. Do you want us to um, talk about the general um, the the general plan for the business or um, answer the questions first? Well, why don't you talk about the general plans? Give us an overview, and then afterwards you can answer the questions. Okay. Did so, you want to uh, go ahead? Sorry. The um, the general plan for the business is um, because I mean you saw the space; it was. Um, we're gonna have one side be, it's gonna be the restaurant, the laid back uh, side that where people can eat and they can drink, they can watch TV. Uh, there'll be two pool tables in there as, um, you know, as eventually at some point we might wanna add a pool table, um, add some arcade games, but for now, that'll be mainly the eating, relaxing, um, playing pool side, there's a hallway that goes over to the nightclub side that will be where you know people can order food they can order drinks and on specified nights there will be music played and um so that's the the general synopsis of of the uh the business uh the questions okay number 1 the kitchen the way the building is set up um, the access to the kitchen is from both the nightclub side and the restaurant side. And for most of the time, the kitchen will be accessed from the restaurant side. Um, we would want to separate the restaurant from the nightclub because on very on slow nights, which could be Sunday through Wednesday, there won't be enough patrons to, um, as we gather from experience, that on those nights, unless there's some kind of special event, on those nights, there won't be enough patrons to really make make good use of the other side with the nightclub um, and have enough staff to, for it to make sense. Um, so let's see. So we would want to have a door closed at that that separates the two spaces to discourage people from wandering around to the other side if there's no staff over there. Um, question, question number three. The hours of operation are more detailed in the management plan. Um, it's on, let's see. Towards the end of the management plan, I think it's page six or five. Um, the 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 hours of operation will be Sunday through Saturday, roughly three a three p.m. to one a.m. And um, I'm sorry, you had a question, Sarah. You're you're muted, Sarah. I'm sorry, if you're at the top of page seven, hours of operation, I think you mean Saturday to Sunday. It's those two nights that it's open three to one, right? Not Sunday through Saturday means a whole week. Yes. Well, we plan to start out, we plan on being open every night. Oh, really? If it oh, turns, okay. Yeah, okay. if it turns out that it's that there is not enough um, business on certain nights, like a Monday or a Sunday, for example, um, then you know we won't be open those nights. But really, to start out, we're, we're going to try to feel out how things go. I see. And um, so the initial plan is is Sunday through Saturday, okay, three p.m. to one a.m. And um, Sunday through Wednesday. Sunday through Wednesday, the nightclub side will be closed. Um, there will be signs in the door. David, you had a question? Yes, I, th I think as I'm looking at it, that the confusion is that you did not in the in the management plan delineate that the Sunday through th Saturday, you're referring to just the restaurant side. 
or, is, oh, okay. or am I not getting that? That's correct? why I was confused. I thought you were talking about the nightclub. So oh, yeah. So it clarify. seems yeah. it seems that the Sunday through Saturday is the restaurant side. You're going to be open seven days, which is what you said yesterday at the site visit. Yeah. And the the Wednesday through Saturday reference is for the nightclub side. Okay. Is yeah. that right? Yes, you're correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so Thursday through Saturday, we're calling those busy nights. Um, the pa patrons will enter through the awning side. That's the um, the address, 41 Boltwood Walk. Um, there will be signs on the doors. There are basically two main entrances, one on the restaurant side that will be accessible Sunday through Wednesday, and then one at Boltwood Walk under the awning, which will be um, accessible Thursday through Saturday. But there will be signs on the door just so that people, the patrons will understand um, where they, they should enter. The, the main reason um, with that one entrance, the double doors, it'll help us control um, you know, the crowd as they come in through that door. We can ID everybody check for weapons, drugs, you know, et cetera. Um, when they exit, that'll be the one exit. Um, it, as long as there isn't an emergency, we have specified emergency exits, um, but those double doors, that'll be the one exit. So that way we can also monitor for anyone trying to leave with drinks or, um, you know, any any type of items that, you know, we don't want leaving the, the premises. Um, so that way it, it helps it helps with the controlling of that aspect. Sarah, you had your hand up. Yeah, it first. sounded like you said patrons would enter the restaurant through the restaurant door only Sunday to Wednesday. Sorry, do you mean that the when the nightclub is open, restaurant patrons have to go through the nightclub to get to the yeah. restaurant? Yes. Yes. Okay. Because, yeah. So there's only ever going to be one entrance operating no yeah. matter what's open. Is that the case? Well, six months in in the um, the management plan, Thursday through Saturday, um, 6 p.m. until 1 a.m. will be, um, patrons will be directed to, to enter through the awning side. Right, even if they're headed to the restaurant. Yes. So there will only be one operating entrance no matter what is open. Yes. Okay. Got it. Thank you. David, you had a question? That was essentially my question. So when the when only the restaurant is open, you can enter through the side entrance to directly into the restaurant. But yes. but when the club is also when both are open, you your patrons will if if somebody has absolutely no intention of going into the club at all, they will still enter through the club and then they will pass through that connecting door to yes. the restaurant side, which will have a staff person there to monitor that movement. Yes. So, right. Okay. Thank you. That's so we can control. Um, what's that? Capacity. Oh. Yeah, that's so we can control the capacity and make sure that we don't go above 300. Keeps the keeps the confusion down, because if we have two entrances open, one person might say, oh, we've had this many people, and the other side might say, well, we had this many people. Now, now we're kind of lost with, we don't want to be going over our designated capacity that way. But you have specific capacities for each part, each side. So yes. you have, it's not just the total. You need to know how many are in the restaurant. Yes, right. ma'am. Yeah. Okay. And, but another question, if everyone's entering through the nightclub, even if they want to get to the restaurant, so you're going to let under 21s in there. Yeah, that's, we don't, we don't have to, um, on those hours, it would, it would be because there's accessibility to that side, to the nightclub side. Um, I would, I'm going to refrain from letting under eight, 
you know, I, I mean, under 21. Um, and just for that purpose of avoiding someone getting mixed in with the crowd that is so if 20. a family so a family can't go to the restaurant if the nightclub is open it's essentially yes because it's it's you know it's more so geared towards you know on those nights we're going to have a lot of college students and it's just it becomes an atmosphere that you know i i've never like me personally in westfield um we've never had um, a family come in once the nightclub is open. Yes. Yeah. All right. I, I and I will just maybe to talk more about later. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, someone said earlier you need need to post the hours of operation in two different places, but that's going to be misleading because you can't get to the restaurant. You know, it's hours, but some hours you enter here and other hours you enter over there. So that's just something to flag to. Yeah. Absolutely. And we can post those on the doorways so that way, um, you know, it's it'll at least help any alleviate any confusion. Right. Please go on. Um, did you did anybody have any more questions? Uh, I have one, if that's okay. Um, okay. Mr. Chair, is it okay with you? Yes. Uh, just wanted to check. No, uh, so uh, thank you for being here. Um, when we were on the site visit, um, I know we did discuss kind of ambient noise that might come out of the building affecting, you know, the neighbors around you um, briefly. Uh, I stepped away for a second while you guys were speaking. I apologize, but my logic for that was I stepped away so I could hear the conversation of two people that were just walking by outside, outside the doors. So kind of my concern is if I can hear every bit of a conversation that's going on on the other side of the wall to the exterior of the building, while there's a conversation going on inside, like I said, as, as you guys know, for someone who's designed many bars, several nightclubs, I do worry about the effect of the noise from the nightclub side. So my understanding um, is that this has been, I mean, this is, this has been the way this, this bar has been run for, um, you know, before COVID when it was club lit. Um, and also during the Hazel's Blue Lagoon tenure, my understanding was that it, you know, at the time they, you know, they probably didn't have um, anything that like a soundproofing, um, you know, type of setup in there as it was, I was kind of had a discussion with the chair. Um, he, he was asking if, you know, if it has to, if it needs to meet the code, um, will we be able to soundproof those walls? But I wasn't, it, it wasn't, um, kind of brought to my attention from the landlady that we were going to be required to, um, soundproof just from the past um ownership of of the bar in the past i think you know before covid and then post covid um, sorry you have a question yeah i but i thought you said that you took out interior walls i mean you took out i don't know it was wallboard or whatever against the exterior walls so the it maybe it's less soundproof now <laughs> than it was um and rob can speak to the you know there's the noise regulations that's part of the building code is it i mean so it's actually not up to the um, landlady it'll be up to yeah. <laughs> the building commissioner right so, so it's actually in the zoning bylaw that um, um if they have live or pre-recorded music it can't exceed 70 decibels from the property line and that's if you know they're measuring with a sound device um and whatever ambient noise, if they're standing at the property line with the sound device and they're measuring above 70, then that's it goes against the zoning bylaw for that specific use. Um, and usually, you know, some people will do mitigation tactics such as putting like an interior wall with a special material that's sound absorbent. Um, also, keeping the doors closed during like peak hours when you're not having as big of a crowd in the line. Usually, your doors are going to be open from like, you know, beginning of the night when people will start going in during the opening and towards the end of the night when people are leaving. 
obviously you're not going to have music playing as much during those times, but, um, and as we've seen with other applications, usually they'll keep those doors closed unless people are coming in in, in big numbers. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what regulates the sound, uh, mitigation. And that's the reason why the board members bring it up so much is because other permits in the past that are, were proposed that are similar to yours. They had to comply with those sound regulations as well. Okay. So the, it cannot exceed, the sound cannot exceed 70 decibels, you said? Mm -hmm. Yep. From the okay. property line. So, um, not sure specifically where it is, but I would say a good rule of thumb is if the doors are closed and you're standing at the parking lot and it goes above that, that might be problematic. But if it's below that or at 70, then you comply with the regulations. Okay. So if someone were standing outside mm. um, at the, From the park, corner, yeah, well, like we see the property line, it's on the plans, right? I mean, haven't it we is, but the entire property is owned by, um, or most of it's owned by Gradonico, um, oh. who's the landlord, uh -huh. which I believe was also called Lincoln Ave Realty or something like that. Yeah. Um, but they own a lot of those buildings and the parking lot is technically owned by the town. Right. So that's kind of the parking, that's kind of the property line from where they're going to be. And that's a good place to sort of judge it. And that's where the police are going to be judging it too. When they get noise complaints, they'll, they'll stand there and, and that's where they're going to measure from. Then that would be the solution is when the, when the DJ is setting up is do a test of the sound um, from that point, I would say probably at the point where the, um, that little kiosk is located. Mm -hmm. like the parking really kiosk right mm -hmm. yeah that'd be a good spot um but also you know you could always just do before you open um some people will do like a test and then have like a standard <laughs> volume that they'll set it at and just stick with that from whenever they have live music or pre-recorded music at the establishment um so it's just one of those things where you have to, you have to test and see which levels work for you um Sarah, you had a question. I didn't well, want to. I would just say, and, and maybe, Rob, you may know some names. There are sound mm -hmm. engineers, sound consultants who can look at look at your plan and look at the way the place is built, I think. and They could recommend a good material for you model, to use that model, into your wall. Yeah. And because it, I know you took down that wall originally that was covering the brick. So if you're putting a new wall, this engineer will give you, or some sort of specialist can give you a good recommendation for material that you can use to muffle the sound like as a soundproofing tactic um and of course you know we don't recommend installing anything before you get this permit i mean it's it's always best to have an idea beforehand to know what could go there and what could work for you um and yeah that's pretty much it i mean there was another business who recently got a special permit um for the spoke live uh chad o'rourke is their owner he had a sound company come and do some um investigation for him so they recommend a certain material that he could use um they even recommend replacing some of his windows and doors because he had a lot of windows and doors in the building that he occupied um with a, a material that's better at containing the sound than what was originally there um and of course you know if you're interested i could provide you with that company's information if you want to reach out to them um yeah that's that's, that's pretty much all i had with that it, it sounds as though that's one of the recommendations we're coming up for this rob yeah. so Okay, I'll definitely do that then. David, you have David. a question? You're on mute. You're on mute. You're muted, David. Unmuting makes it much easier to ask my point of order question of the chair. I'm, I just want, am I correct in, in assuming that everybody on the panel has read all of the documents that we got and therefore we're familiar with this application? Are you, are the applicants going, are they in the midst of a presentation or can we ask questions about any part of the application at any time? I don't want to divert what you're doing. It I but I just want to know what the what the flow is for this hearing, so that I don't get in your way if something I, is I would on like my them mind. To f I would like them to finish their presentation right. before we start asking any more questions. I agree. 
good. So do you guys have anything else you want to, to talk about with us to, I guess, explain your business or talk about how you're going to manage it? Or um, there were some questions raised about um, screening of trash receptacles, deliveries of, you know, bar goods, restaurant goods, maybe talk about how your kitchen's going to work, like any of that stuff. So <clears throat> regarding um, the trash and any, you know, debris that's uh, left outside, um, we'll have bouncers designated to cleaning up those areas um, throughout the night and especially right at the end. Um, we have a couple barrels that we'll use to um, kind of store our recycling and separate our recycling from um, our general trash. The trash will be brought to the Kellogg Street, uh, the corner where the, that dumpster is. Was it 17? 17 Kellogg. 17, yeah. Um, as well as the um, any oil or grease that we have. Um, there are barrels next to that dumpster as well. Um, regarding the kitchen, we have a, we kind of have a, a base, kind of a baseline of what we want to start with. Um, you know, myself, I'm not, I'm not a chef, but I, you know, also I have, I do have some contacts that, you know, we can start working on, you know, putting together a more intensified menu. But for now, um, I want to, uh, you know, keep it simple, fried food. Uh, and ranging, you know, from chicken tenders, mozzarella sticks, French fries, and burgers, wings. We can do burgers. Um, those items are um, a definite. So, um, and we'll that will be accessible, you know, the entire week um, to the to the public as they come in throughout um, throughout their time. The the staff is going to be trained. First of all, the bartenders um, will be trained with a TIP certification that they will be required to have a TIP certification, um, which is a, a tremendous resource. If you've ever taken that course, it's it's actually pretty good, very uh, thorough and informative. Um, they will be trained um, to, um, you know, watch out for signs of intoxication. The um, bouncers, that otherwise known as security staff, they'll be Everybody will be trained for crowd man. I know we only need two in a situation of um, two hundred. You know, with the three hundred occupancy, we only need two crowd managers. But um, if they're all trained for the crowd management um, certification, then we don't have to worry about making sure that so and so is on duty because he's the one certified. Um, They'll they'll all be trained and work in conjunction with each other, making sure that if there's something going on on one side, they will communicate with each other um, from a different different side of the uh, establishment. So and all all of this um, in general, the 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 business as a whole will be monitored by our um, manager that we selected. Um, I believe some of you met her. Uh, her name's Reese Deshays. Um, I don't know if she was able to. Uh, Rob, I don't know if you were able to maybe uh, invite her on to the, yeah. if, you, if you wouldn't mind. I know yeah, she I does. Do she has some good input because she's going to be the frontline manager of everything. Um, yep. Yeah, and that's Reese. Yep. So, um, Reese, if you, um, if you want to just give your insight and your input on um, how you're going to operate, um, Oh, yeah, my, so yeah. Um, I will be there as manager um, of our bar staff, and as far as training is concerned, um, upon application, they do need to provide us with a TIP certification. They will also be trained, trained as far as bartending serving in general, um, specifically by myself or Gabe, um, or both. Um, and what were the other questions just so I can address what we are looking for, Gabe? Um, so they just kind of, um, how we're going to go about, you know, what the, I guess the handling of patrons, you know, going through each side, you know, if we're having, um, you know, if we have a night where it's, you know, we're very busy, um, 
you know, how many staff, like I would say we'd have a bouncer on every door, uh, making sure we yeah. have staff. Yeah. So um, as far as security staff, like Andrea said, um, everybody is going to be fully um, crowd control certified, but the rest of them as well, um, they are all going to have the ability, they'll know how to use a scanning system as far as IDs are concerned. Um, as far as placement and doorways, that's one thing that we actually really excel at, at least in our bar in Westfield. Um, we do zoning with everybody, so everybody is um, responsible for their zone. So whoever will be put on each door, whether it be an emergency exit, the entrance, um, the transition door between the restaurant and the bar, just so that there's clear communication between physical entrance and then the transition point to from the bar or nightclub area to the restaurant slash bar area, just so that we are able to control each sides because there are two separate um, capacities. Um, and the nice thing about the setup too is that those folks that do want to enter the restaurant side, we have that straightaway just ramp that goes up into that transition door. So it will make the setup of um, bouncers security a lot easier just in leading them into that direction to make sure that they're counted as capacity over on that side. Um, and then the bartenders as well, um, very aware of capacity, um, how we need to be staffed based on a what we would consider a busier night, slow night. We've already made decisions on how it's going to be staffed on each side um, and security and bartending. Um, is there anything else that? And I was going to add to add to that race. Um, bouncers are not just willy nilly walking around, you know, like just, Oh, you know, I'm just over here now. Every single bouncer has a specific job. They have a specific spot to be that's how we operate in westfield it's it's keeps the confusion rate to a minimum um it you know it it's almost you know almost like uh zone defense in a basketball court you have you know one bouncer is going to be in an area that requires you scanning ids and you do that job you focus on that only instead of you're you're trying to watch a whole bunch of people and scan ids it, it gets confusing so that we'll have We'll have that um, implemented as as a big a big deal for our staff. And then, were there any questions about um, management or, yeah, Rob? It's okay if I ask a question, Mr. Chair. Yes. Are you, well, let me let me ask if they're yep. done with their presentation. Yeah, sure. I believe we've covered everything. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, I yeah. Sorry, go, go ahead, ahead, Rob. I have a couple of questions. But... Yeah, sure. Mine will be quick. Um, so just one thing um, that came up while you're talking about you know crowd control and, and the and the bouncers. Um, and also you don't see zone defense in basketball outside of college basketball these days. That's yeah. Do you not I, see that yeah, in the pros? Like, yeah, that's that's how I'm <laughs> college fan myself. So yeah. Um, I was gonna ask. So say you have two different bouncers who are crowd controlled or crowd manager certified at each entrance of the side of the business, right? You have the restaurant side, one guy with a clicker there. Main entrance, nightclub side, another guy with a clicker. So for the sake of comparison, let's say that the restaurant side has occupancy of 80, and then the nightclub side has occupancy of 120, right? So say you have people coming in, you decide that people can go towards the back, or sorry, to the restaurant side, and then the restaurant side gets up to 80, and then the nightclub side gets up to the 120 so now you reach full occupancy in both sides so i guess my question is when you reach full occupancy in the restaurant side and the nightclub side how are you gonna get people out of the restaurant side are you gonna have them come back through the nightclub side or are they as gonna be instructed as, to leave through the um a different exit so as far as um the exit, just exiting the um, establishment is concerned, are you asking? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you reach full capacity in both sides, how are you going to get people out of the restaurant side? Because they're going to have, from what you've told me, they're only going to be able to go in out that one specific entries, entryway, which happens to go through the nightclub as well. Am I correct in understanding and assuming that? 
As far as entry is concerned, absolutely. The okay. uh, awning side, as far as exiting is concerned, mm -hmm. and just because we are going to be staffed in order to do so to maintain um, our um, information as far as capacity is concerned, I think using that side door, right, Gabe, was the option yeah, for the exit out of the restaurant. Yeah. So that yeah. way we are able to have a clear visual of that door from the transitional door because mm -hmm. um, we are capable of doing that in that capacity um, so that we are able to um, communicate back and forth. Okay, we just had a patron exit from the restaurant door. That exit part um, is not the problem over in that door. It's They just can't enter over there, but they have multiple exits if they need to go through the side or and they'll be instructed if they try to go through the back and we are at capacity they'll just be asked to leave out of the um side door I, okay. my question is uh similar to that mm -hmm. um i would assume that there will be people who come to the restaurant who want to then go to the nightclub and may order i i assume also that you you have food service to both sides is that correct? Yes. Yes. Sir. Yeah. And then if someone comes to the restaurant side and wants to move to the uh, nightclub side, are there would their food be brought over? Do they have to reorder? How how are you going to manage that? I would assume that if they were eating on if they had ordered food on the restaurant side and they were eating it, they'd probably want to finish it before they go over to the nightclub. Unless it's filling up on the nightclub side, they want to make sure they've got a table. That's a good point. Um, I, I've gone into other establishments like that and then said, could you please move me over to the other side or to wherever it may be? We can assist them in in, um, in that capacity as long as as long as the um, you know, back to the word capacity, as long as the capacity wasn't um, too much or, you know, at capacity and there was enough room for them to get over there. Yeah, we could, I would we assume that... What we could do is communicate between the kitchen staff and um, Reese as well. Um, if someone orders something and then they end up on the other, we can instruct them if they do uh, go to the club side before say their order is ready. Um, we'll ask them to stand at least stand over by, you know, that corner of the bar and the where the entrance of the kitchen is, just so that, you know, we can keep the description of them the same as it was, and also, you know, we'll have their name, um, and just to kind of avoid that confusion, so that they they're not just standing somewhere crazy. You know, we'll we'll definitely keep them informed so that way they're they're not getting lost. Yeah. Uh... Are you also thinking that you might have live music at some point? Um, it was, it's a possibility, but because Way down the road. yeah, because we haven't had much success with it. Um, unfortunately, it's kind of uh, from what I've been seeing, it's it's starting to fade away, and at least down in the um, Holyoke, Westfield, and West Springfield area, um, if. I understand that the Drake across the street um, does, you know, they do a, they have a big um, following with live music. So we probably won't just, you know, right away, just based off of that knowledge, we won't um, jump right into live music. Uh, Rob, does, does their uh, petition, which says that they're going to use, uh, they're not using live music. Does it need to be changed at all? No. So basically, no. um, the um, accessory uses they're applying for. There's two of them. They have the outdoor dining, which that one patio area in the alleyway outside of the restaurant entrance. And then they have the live and pre-recorded music. So it's, it's kind of in that same category. So there's nothing they have to do, but I would recommend conditioning where if they want to do live in-person performances, so like, you know, have like a band or something like that, um, that's, you know, you condition that, that they have to come um, meet with the billing commissioner to make sure it doesn't do like a substantial, it's not like a substantial change to their management or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, nothing they have to change right now on their end. Okay. Sarah? 
Yeah, a couple things. I I had the impression you didn't want people to move back and forth between the restaurant and the club. So the suggestion that you can order on one side and go hang out, I would think that just makes tracking the capacity a lot harder. You could consider saying, look, if you're going to the restaurant, great, finish your meal, exit, come around, come around, re-enter, you know, or otherwise you're going to have to be adding and subtracting people moving back and forth. And I, and I, maybe I misunderstood. I thought you didn't want to do that. My other question is about exiting from the restaurant. We haven't talked much about the outdoor dining part of that. If that happens, like even at 10 o'clock at night, I don't know, maybe, maybe it doesn't, but you've got a couple doors. Is one, is one basically an in and out for the patio dining, but then there'll be another one for just exiting the business. Cause you don't want to have people exit into the patio dining. I don't think if they're, if they're done with their meal. So I don't understand how, how exiting will be different from going to the patio to eat. There would be somebody who would um, show them to the to a patio table and monitor that door. We would have security staff at those doors to assist with any you know exiting or entering um, when it comes to the patio, because those doors lock from the outside. If you exit, the doors lock and you can't get in unless someone opens it from the inside. Um, so if a patron wants to use the bathroom, they have to knock to be let in. It can be unlocked as well. Okay. Are you going to have some kind of fencing, some kind of boundary around the patio area? Yes. yes. Yep. Can people enter the patio area directly or do they have to go through the restaurant? They have to go through the restaurant. All right. So then back to my other question. So then when people are exiting, leaving the restaurant, they're using a different, yet another door that doesn't go out into the patio or they'll be stuck there. <laughs> right. It's, it's not going right. They're not going to go through the patio to, you know, they're not going to go through that seating area in order to exit. So it's you have be, a second exit. Yes. There, there are um, three doors on that side of the building um, all on that wall mm -hmm. and the, the, the fourth doorway is on the other side under the awning. So yeah, if you look at the floor plan, you'll see that there are three doorways, um, under the overhang. Right. Right. <laughs> Excuse me. And here are the plans right here. Just give everybody a bare perspective of mm -hmm. what they're talking about. So down here is the outdoor dining. Mm -hmm. This is the alleyway. This is the overhang, the hash line. Mm -hmm. um, tables here. So I'm assuming exit, exit, then exit right here that goes into the hallway between the bar and the uh, restaurant down here. So it seems like, according to this, the tables are right here in front of these two windows. So like... Are you proposing shifting these tables to like one of these two entryways and then having like a fence or like a screen area around it and then leaving the other side to be an exit for those coming out of here? Yeah, the the, the fence, so to speak, is going mm -hmm. to um it's going to if you see maybe I should share a screen. Um You can if you want to. You actually um you do have screen sharing capabilities if you want yeah. to take over. Let me see if I can get the map up on my screen. Mm -hmm. Oops. Okay, bear with me. Okay, I'm going to screen share. Okay, can you see my mouse? Yep. Okay, right about here, um, we would have a fence that comes out and then come around this way because we, we can't block off this passageway the fence would come out here and down and actually this table would have to be over on this side um the fence would come out here go around 
and down to this area so that these tables are blocked off and then this can be passable for to the patio. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing now. Um, Mr. Slobodar. So I am not trying to change your business plan with this suggestion because I have no personal interest in running a nightclub or a restaurant. But it seems that the source of a lot of the questions and confusion is the link between the two sides of your operation. If there, I, I would just throw out a suggestion to you that perhaps if there is a way to essentially operate them as two separate entities where there is an entrance to the restaurant side, it'll be easy to control the capacity on the restaurant side and an entrance to the nightclub side. If you don't have to go through the nightclub side to get to the restaurant, you don't have to monitor who's coming into the nightclub and then leaving to go into the restaurant. Do I add them to the nightclub capacity and then deduct them because they went into the restaurant? And then you can control easily, I would think, the movement between the two entities. So if you have the physical setup in place, where you can operate the restaurant and have access to the restaurant when the nightclub is closed so nobody is actually walking through the empty nightclub space to get into the restaurant, then perhaps it would be helpful to consider operating the restaurant that same way even when the nightclub is in operation. So there it would eliminate a lot of the questions that we are asking, I think, based on the link between the two operations. I know I'm a bit confused about how you would know if you're checking somebody in through the double doors, how do you absolutely know that they went into the restaurant unless you're constantly monitoring the capacity in the restaurant and deducting it You'd have to be a math major to pull that one off when it's really busy. So that's just an observational suggestion. I'm not trying to be, get, I'm not trying to redo your business. I'm trying to eliminate confusion on our end. Thanks. Are there any other questions from board members? <laughs> Sarah? Um, so if the, the dumpster, as I understand it, it's the one, it's like behind Mexicalito. It's like right, almost right on Kellogg street. That's quite a walk, you know, pushing your trash barrels or whatever. You have to go through the parking lot and basically in the road to get down to that dumpster. So that's going to take somebody away from whatever else they're doing for several minutes. So do you have the capacity to, you know, I don't know how quickly you generate trash. Is this, you can you can hang on to it through the whole evening and then just oh, make one trip at the end of the night? Absolutely. Is that the case? Okay. Yeah. We have um, at least one barrel with wheels, a giant barrel with wheels on it that will be, will be used to um, bring the trash down. Yes. Well, to build on the, off of what Sarah said, um, so this, I guess we'll call it temporary uh, dumpster, right? Your little trash bin that you're going to uh, roll down to the big dumpster. Um, is that going to be stored in a like um, conspicuous place? So like, is it going to be like around the corner where nobody can see it? Or is it going to be like at the employee entrance that's like kind of not visible from the alleyway or from the street? Or is it going to be like out in the open where people can see it? So we're going to have um, one smaller barrel that has wheels um, that will be able to be the kind of inside the restaurant and nightclub um, trash barrel. Um, you know, we'll have a bouncer or a bar back, most likely. Um, bar back will collect all the trash, you know, throughout the night. Um, once that fills up, he'll throw it, the trash from that barrel into the bigger barrel. That bigger barrel should be able to hold 
at least two to three bags of that smaller barrel's contents. And then that bigger barrel will be stored in the area where um, those showers are and those lockers that um, I think I showed someone briefly. I think you might have seen it. Um, that will be the area where we'll store the trash since there will customers won't be able to access that um, area at all. Yeah, that's just for the night. It's not meant to stay there for a week. Um, it's just until we close up operations for the night and then it can be removed. But th that whole space back there is not accessible to customers. Those rooms as well, well, the, the showers um, will be utilized as storage for, you know, beer bottles. Um, the companies that uh, qual quality distribution and um, commercial distribution, they collect the empty bottles that we save and we, we get credited for those bottles. Um, so we save those, but any cardboard boxes will be broken down and kept in that, in the, one of those shower rooms. Um, and then, you know, at a certain point, we'll, you know, myself, you know, we'll transport it to the, uh, to the transfer station. Okay. Um, so I guess one thing I recommend to the board, Mr. Chair, before we continue is that you place a condition where um, at the end of each night or at the close of business that they have the trash removed and put into that dumpster, uh, just so we don't have trash sitting inside for, I would say, more than a full day. Um, and the zoning board does have the authority to condition that, just a heads up. Sounds like a good idea. Mm -hmm. Mr. White? Um. <clears throat> So I'm just trying to actually visualize when you talk about a trash barrel, are you speaking about like the standard restaurant round 44 gallon? Yes, sir. Um, that are on wheels. Okay, cool. Yes, sir. Um, and with then I cover. assume, oh, sorry, go ahead. With a cover. Well, the, so the, the, the 44 gallon um, barrel, um, I, I believe they do come with covers. That one um, is not the one we'll, that will be wheeled out to the, uh, to the parking or to the dumpster the bigger one has it, it's basically you know what you see and you know it, it resembles something you'd see around city streets um and residences that have their trash picked up um so it's it's big and durable and um it'll be it'll just be easier for us to carry you know at a farther distance you know with a bigger load of trash yeah because that was my question because having a uh seeing people struggle to empty those 44 gallon ones um i i've thrown around many a keg in my life you know having to hook them up but those things can be very cumbersome so that's why i just wanted to check no absolutely sarah yeah can you can you say more about the the empty bottles that you're saving if they're around for if if if, if they stay in the building for for more than a, a night you know do you clean them first? Are they stored in something with a lid? Because I would think that would attract. Yes. Yeah. So they'll, yeah, yeah, they'll be, they'll be um, inside the cases that they, that they arrived in um, and they'll be stored in their own separate area. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll rinse them out and clean them out as we go through the night. Um, everything's poured out um, just to mitigate that, you know, the fruit fly factor. Can I also ask or, or say go back to um, early in the discussion, you talked about how you may want to put a door to close off the nightclub when it's not open. Um, given that you have a full bar over there, I would think you definitely want to be able to lock that, <laughs> lock that yeah. and keep people out of there. Um, and I would think we might want to require that. Yes. You no. Know, so you don't want your employees or or anybody just going in and helping themselves or whatever. Yeah. No, absolutely. So we'll have that door will be only accessible um, by the staff. Um, there's there, you know, there won't be any reason for any anyone, you know, staff included other than um, Reese or myself um, to go over on that side um, when, you know, when it's only the restaurant operating hours. Um, so just because we have everything we need on that, on that restaurant bar side, um, you know, alcohol, you know, food related, um, entertainment that's, and we'll keep that door 
I I was thinking probably just have a key if you want to go in and out of that door. You know, we'll keep it locked, and the person that can go in and out um, will be the key holder. And the same thing. It's also directly accessible from the kitchen, of course. So yes. do you want to lock that? Yes. Also. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions, Mr. Slovatar? Uh, Mr. Chair, is this is this an appropriate time to bring up something completely different than we've been talking about, or uh, is it still related to this it's, issue? It's not related to trash. No, it doesn't have to be related to trash. Okay, okay. Um, I have thoroughly read your management plan, and I actually find it credible and reasonable, and and accept almost all of it except for one section, and that is the emergency section on page six. At the beginning, it says that the access to the business would be, could be from North Pleasant's, oh, wow. What high tech person did that? Uh, okay, so the fire department can access the business from North Pleasant Street, Street through the alley next to Antonio's Pizza uh, or the Boltwood parking lot. Obviously, the Boltwood parking lot is wide open. Mm -hmm. To call the passageway next to Antonio's Pizza an alley is pretty generous, in my opinion. Uh, it is the width of one large Antonio's pizza box, which I have actually carried down that alley with no more than an inch to spare total on the width. You can carry a box horizontally, but if you hold it on the side, your knuckles will be bleeding for days. This is a very narrow space, and I question whether a fully equipped firefighter could even get down that space. Uh, I, it, is, it is a difficult space to negotiate. You can't possibly pass another person. So if there was actually an emergency, I don't believe that that is a credible access to the club. And I'm bringing this up because the, if, if I'm right and I, might not be, so perhaps I'd love to see a fully equipped firefighter try and dash down that alley, that passageway. It means that almost the only access in the case of an emergency is through the Boltwood parking lot, which raises, that doesn't mean this, that's not a, a, a game changer really, except that it, would make it necessary to have a really good plan to control the people outside waiting to get in and how, how you deal with that little courtyard area outside if there would be an emergency. Nobody expects an emergency. Nobody expects a shooter, but this happens to be the 11th anniversary of the Sandy Hook shootings and nobody expected anyone to want to kill 20 little kids. So you just never know. An emergency plan is to deal with things that nobody sees coming. So you're, you're re the reference in here about directing people, I just want to raise the point that this needs to be carefully considered. I don't consider that passageway to be uh, uh, an access, a suitable access to emergency services and that your staff will need to address the flow of people in that courtyard area outside the double doors. So I'm not, I'm, that's the only part of your plan. Everything else I thought is actually really well done. And um, I, I applaud you on, on your, how you're addressing everything. But I'd like, I'd like to see the emergency plan a bit better defined, please. 
I, I think I can say, speak to that very clearly. When we had the Yellow Sun Natural Food Store at the top of the alleyway, all of our storage was in the basement at the end of the alleyway. And I have carried hundreds of 50 pound bags on my shoulders, in my arms, up and down that alleyway many, 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 many times. So I will say that a firefighter going down that alley is not a problem. I am so happy to be wrong that it's <laughs> not a problem for me. I That's fine. If it's not a problem, just, it's not a problem. I'm not trying to make it a problem. Right. I just know, I don't know how you carried a hundred pound or a, a 50 pound bag of something when I struggled with a pizza, but you're more manly than I am. I, I, I it's was not younger. an issue. <laughs> I was a lot younger. 50 years younger. Rob? I just want to, um, he does bring up a good point, but also I am reviewing the uh, transmittal from the fire department. And in terms of access, they didn't really express any concerns from their end about getting to the site. They only stated that, um, you know, the Knox box and the uh, fire department connection are both on North Pleasant Street in front of the building from the North Pleasant Street side. So, um, you know, they were kind of just staying where it's located, but they didn't really highlight any big concerns on their end about getting down the alleyway. I'm assuming they'll probably pull the truck around the parking lot area and have one guy just run down with, with the connection hose to go to the fire hydrant. Sarah? So David's comment has me thinking um, I that it might be wise to include in the plan, or at least please consider this, that in the if, if patrons have to be evacuated, they are not allowed to go into that alley because that That's would be point. that would be a terrible place to have a stampede or people jammed up, especially if fire personnel are trying to get down so that the bouncers would no, you go towards the pocket parking lot, you cannot go into the alley. Good idea. I, I will also say there used to be a fill pipe in the alley there that you had to twist your hips around when you're going up there with a bag oh. of grain on your shoulders. <laughs> Craig, I have an entire list of newfound admiration for you. <laughs> <laughs> between twisting your way down the alley and carrying all that weight, I will never walk down that, that alley with the same mindset again. So well, I... We, we will not ask you to carry bags of grain. Thank you. Um, this, I did want to comment. Now that we're talking about this, I remembering there's a wider alleyway um i believe it's off of main street um that might even be a better access for the the fire department um but yeah i i think it makes sense to be very specific about the evacuation plan um especially if they're patrons outside the benefit we have in Westfield is that we have one entrance in the front and then we have an emergency exit in the back. So there's two ways to get out each end as opposed to, you know, there's, I mean, we have all those doors that people can, you know, in case of an emergency can exit through, but um, it does make it easier when we have, we have a larger parking lot behind us as well in Westfield. Um, and then in the front of the bar is like is Elm Street. It's the main drag through downtown. Um, but those that, you know, that being said, um, you know, having having the accountability of making sure everyone is out. We'll probably have bouncers making sure that they can clear each room, you know, that there were customers in and work their way forward towards the doors so as to make sure we're not forgetting anybody in case of you know, there was be a fire, or, you know, something of that capacity. Any other questions? Rob. So I guess this question is more for Rob Mora, who I know is on the meeting with his screen um, 
shut off and his uh, microphone muted, but if he's nearby and able to speak to this, I was hoping he can give some general, I guess, background or guidance to the applicants in terms of soundproofing um, the nightclub portion of the business and I guess resources they could consider if they want to pursue that further. Um, Rob Mora, if you're on, would you be able to speak to that? So, yeah, I haven't, I haven't been in the building recently, um, you know, but there certainly are techniques that, you know, could be used depending on the scope of work that's going to be done to help with soundproofing. I did look at the building permit record and it looks like we, we've only issued permit, a permit so far for uh, some selective demolition of the stage area and a room, the wall surrounding a room over on the uh, restaurant side. Uh, but if work was to get more involved, um, particularly on the, the outside walls, um, there certainly are techniques that could be used to improve the, the sound rating and the transmission through those walls. Um, and we can, you know, we can assist the, uh, the applicant if they, if they get into that. Well, if there aren't any other questions, uh, we can solicit general public comment. So I am not seeing anybody in Zero. attendance. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> I think we scared them all off um, during our conversation. So there, I don't think there's going to be any public comment, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, if there aren't any more co any public contents, I entertain a motion to continue the public hearing for ZBA FY 2024-7 to uh, an additional date when uh, Steve Judge is back to assist in finalizing everything. So we I guess... Date certain. So I guess one thing to consider is, um, I guess first we should probably tell the applicant what we need for the next meeting, right? Do you want me to go through that real quick, Mr. Please. Chair? Okay, yeah. So just a general sense, because the board doesn't feel this application is fully complete yet to just pending this review today to move forward with approving yet, we recommend that um, you clarify the hours of operation for each side, so for the restaurant side and the uh, nightclub side in a way that's it's more understandable in your management plan. Um, you start exploring soundproofing mitigation. And of course, if you want us to, to work on you with, to work with you on that, um, you could definitely reach out. Um, and then also uh, it wouldn't hurt to include sound mitigation strategies in your management plan as well. Um, and that could also include keeping your doors closed within certain periods of time when you're open. Um, I would say address the issue of reaching full capacity on both sides of the establishment and how you're going to safely exit people when you're at capacity from the restaurant side. Um, because you had mentioned that people would come and go through that one entryway that connects the two buildings, but you also mentioned that people could also exit one of those emergency exits on the restaurant side. So I would say having a more clear plan for that would, would be helpful as well. Um, talking about what on nights when the nightclub side is closed, it would be helpful to have an idea of whether you're going to keep that door locked that, that connects both the restaurant side and the nightclub side. We might need more clarification on that. Um, and then you would want to include in your emergency management section of your, of your management plan, um, preventing how you're going to prevent patrons from going down that alleyway that goes towards North Pleasant Street in the event of an emergency so you don't block emergency access for the fire department to get there. Um, and then one thing I'm going to add and include for the next meeting, Mr. Chair, I was going to make a map that shows the proximity of the closest fire hydrants to the building so we can kind of get a general idea of where the fire department could hook up in the event of emergency to, to give a better perspective. Um, and that's pretty much it. In terms of dates, Craig, you're going to be gone early January. Could you remind me when you're going to be back? When you are back on absent? the fifteenth of January. 
15th. Okay. And Mr. Judge is leaving on the 18th of January. So that makes it tricky for meeting time in January. So we have the 16th and the 17th as a possible date in January. Otherwise, the applicants are going to have to wait until early February to hear this matter again before the board. So I don't know if the board members feel okay with something like that or or what the group is feeling. I see Sarah has her hand up. I will not be able to meet on Tuesdays, generally speaking, once I'm on the school committee. There is a meeting on the 16th. So Craig- I'm happy to meet on Wednesday the 17th, if that's- 17th. Um, how would that work for you, Craig, Wednesday the 17th? Because Steve Judge said that Wednesday the 17th could work for him if if able to to meet that day. Let me check my calendar. And do other board members have an objection to Wednesday the 17th of January to, to continue this? I'm I'm fine with it. Okay. Okay. Oh, my mistake. Actually, no, never mind. Sorry, 17th is good. Mr. Judge will be gone the 18th. So, Mr. Craig, are you good on the 17th? The 17th is good. Okay, so I recommend to the board that you continue this hearing to January 17th at 6 p.m., which is a Wednesday. This board typically meets on Thursdays, just so the applicant can come by, come back within a reasonable amount of time. That's not too long. And they're able to do the changes that the board requests of them. you have a motion for that? So moved. Second. Anyone? Sarah? Second. Go for it, Sarah. And I did. Good for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so then the vote uh, occurs on the motion offered offered by to uh, continue the public hearing for ZBA FY 2024-7 to January 17th. 17th. Mm -hmm. 2024. Uh, 2024. Yep. There's a motion in a second uh, to approve. We need a, a unanimous vote of the board. The chair votes aye. Mr. White? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Okay. Alrighty. I I don't believe it's going to be an onerous task for you to get this stuff done uh, within this time period. And uh, we appreciate your coming for us and look forward to the nightclub and the restaurant. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Have a good night. Take care. You too. Good night. Okay. Uh, next, we have, <clears throat> if there are any other issues that are not before the board this evening. So did you want me to give my update for scheduling now, Craig, or wait till after general public comment solicitation? Uh, why don't we wait for general uh, until yeah. after the general public comment solicitation? Okay. Sounds okay. Good. Mm -hmm. Are there any public, are, is there anyone even on the public? That's no, looking? there is. <laughs> okay. So not too much public comment. <laughs> So you don't have to wait too long. No, Look, we won't I wait, like you, you guys. Won't wait in, we won't delay any longer. <laughs> right. This is not exciting enough. <laughs> no, apparently not. All right, I'll. Uh, I guess I can give a brief update on the schedule. So, yes, um, please. Yep. So next Thursday, December twenty first, um, is the. Oh my gosh, I think we're on the fourth meeting now for the forty Bs, um, and then. The following Thursday after that, December 28th, we do have a ZBA meeting scheduled. Um, there is a public hearing, but it's for a modification to an existing comprehensive permit, uh, North Square, uh, the Coles project. Um, so basically, they have existing commercial space that they're trying mm -hmm. to change the tenant for. Um, right now, it used to be a retail, but they're trying to get a photography studio into that space. And unfortunately, the permit is conditioned to where they have to come back at a public hearing each time to get that, I know, to get that approved. But the funny thing is they're also requesting to get rid of that condition or changes so it's done administratively as opposed to, 
a public meeting. Uh, so save them time and money. Um, and then after that, we have a meeting on January 4th, which Mr. Meadows, I know you can't attend, but that's for the 40B Valley CDC project. Uh, that'll be the meeting in which we discuss uh, waivers and conditions with the applicants. Um, week after that, January 11th, um, will be a normally scheduled meeting, but we don't have anything on the books for that date yet. 18th of January, sorry, 17th of January, we have this hearing continued. Um, the 18th, we don't know if anything's going to happen yet on that date. And then the 25th, normally scheduled meeting, nothing on the books. But since I have four people here, I wanted to ask, in terms of December 28th, I know that's between Christmas and New Year's. Uh, and I know today Hanukkah is almost over. And so far, I have Mr. Sloviter and Ms. Greenbaum who are willing to participate, as well as Mr. Judge for that December 28th meeting. Since we only need at least three panelists because it's a 40B as opposed to four, which you need for special permits, is there anybody on this call that would be available to serve on that panel for December 28th? Is that a yes, you could, mm -hmm. Ms. Marshall? Okay, cool. Uh, Mr. White, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Sloviter, well, Mr. Sloviter already said yes, but you're probably busy. And Philip, I'm assuming you're going to be busy too. Wait, busy um, with what? I am going to be what, busy, but if you need me, then 28th. I will be. 28th. 28th of December. I can yeah, do I know the you 28th. can. I know you can. I'm asking oh. other people. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mr. White, did you, uh, would you say it before you get cut off? Yeah, no, I said, uh, yeah, I mean, I will be busy around that time, but <laughs> if I'm needed, I can move stuff around. Okay. Yeah. So for now, I'll just keep you on the bench. Uh, and then I'll ask other people if they're available. Um, Sarah? So I, I want to go back to January 17th when we're yes. done talking about the 28th. So um, I, I don't think we have done. anything else to discuss. I mean, I know Phil. Well, I, just maybe... wanted to, I just want to say if yeah. there might also be a meeting the next day on the 18th, could mm -hmm. just those projects, if there are any, just be pushed to the 17th and not have the possibility of two meetings in a row. Yeah, we could. Um, so that's a good point. Moving the scheduled meeting one day early. <laughs> we just have to advertise it a week beforehand just so people know. Um, but yeah, that's definitely possible. And I think Steve would be okay with that, seeing that he's going to be gone the next day on the 18th. So um, yeah, that would probably be the best move. Um, thank you for bringing that up. That's a good suggestion. And uh, that's all I had. Okay. If nobody has anything else, uh, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. There's got to be a second. Come okay, on, second. somebody be brave. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a second. Okay. Um, in that case, the motion is not debatable and requires a roll call vote. Chair votes aye. Mr. White? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. Mr. Slovacher? Aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>